Champion, New York, New Jersey, ADL, Hamgabar, uh, Pali. My name is Varela Karpinian. Thank you for attending the introduction of the latest book, Precarious Armenia, by our speaker, Dr. Girard Libaridian, who is a historian, scholar, educator, and a diplomat. <clears throat> Dr. Libaridian is a luminary in the field of Armenian history, an internationally respected figure as a scholar and diplomat. He truly needs no introduction. Nevertheless, let's take a closer look at his remarkable journey. Dr. Libaridian's journey in public life began as the editor of Aspare's newspaper, where he displayed passion for promoting knowledge and awareness Later, he edited the Armenian Review Quarterly, which he transformed from an ideological tool into a scholarly and intellectual form. His commitment to understanding Armenian history and politics led him to co-found the Zorian Institute that addressed, in addition to modern history, contemporary issues in Soviet Armenia and the diaspora, a vital institution in the study of Armenian political thought. With a profound understanding of history, Dr. Libaridian holds a doctorate in history from the University of California, Los Angeles, showcasing his expertise and dedication to his field. His academic journey saw him teaching at prestigious institutions, including the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Massachusetts, and Tufts and Rutgers universities, where he shared his knowledge and inspired countless students. Dr. Libaridian made a significant contribution to the foreign and security policies of Armenia by serving as an advisor to President Levon de Bedrosian as first Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Secretary of the National Security Council with the rank of extraordinary and plenipotentiary ambassador of Armenia. After his tenure in Armenia, he returned to academia as Alex Manugian Professor of Modern Armenian History at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. In addition to teaching, he oversaw the expansion of the activities of the Armenian Studies Program and continued to contribute to the scholarly world through his insightful articles and books. Dr. Libaridian is the author of numerous books and articles published in English, Armenian, French, German, Turkish, Arabic, Kurdish, and Russian that continue to enrich our understanding of history, policies, and politics. His latest volume, A Precarious Armenia, the occasion for this lecture today, is expected to be translated to other languages as well as Hindi. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Girani Baridian, a visionary scholar and leader in the exploration of Armenian history, political thought, and identity. say, Marinak didn't say it, but they don't know what I'm going to say. And you shouldn't take what I'm saying as being supported by the Ramgavar party. But I appreciate it that uh, the party invites people 
who, uh, with whom they may not fully agree. And I expect that many will not. In Yerevan, a few months ago, um, there's a butcher. When I go to Yerevan now, my daughter and grandson live there, so I stay a long time. And I'm like a housewife. You know, I take the kid to karate, chess, school, uh, and we do shopping together. I cook. Uh, my daughter is an MD and she comes late. So uh, I have very direct contact with the shopkeepers. Of course, no one has better relations with the lady shopkeepers than our grandson. You know, he's, he's a charmer. And uh, this butcher had not realized who I am. He knew Baron Giraffe. <clears throat> Until some time, at some point, they, on television, they showed my photo and said something about it. And the next time he saw me, he said, Baron Giraffe, Janas, Czech, I said to Govic, uh, who are you, etc. And I said, you know, it doesn't matter. Will it make any difference on the price of the meat I buy? And if it does, then I'll tell you why. <laughs> so, and then he said, uh, I saw what you said on television, and of course we respect you, but everyone has his own opinion, right? Which means I don't agree with you, which was perfectly fine. And I said, I'm glad you don't agree, because if you agreed, if everyone agreed with me, it means we're not living in a democratic country. And all of us would have to agree whoever is the non-democratic element at the top. So I am not uh, really uh, concerned with people agreeing with me as long as we, we can talk to each other. And I told uh, this very nice fellow that disagreeing is obviously part of our lives, but if one of us is wrong and one right, uh, then uh, really it may not ma matter if you're the butcher and I'm the customer. But if one of us, maybe the wrong one, is the leader of the country, then it matters whether he or she is right or wrong and which one of us is right. That's the difference. Now, um, I will do a, a quick survey of the book, present it with the book, and then make some more general comments. Uh, the book is, I think you have copies here, it's 600 pages, which is very scary. Some people decide to read books if uh, they're kind of small, right? Uh, but uh, I have good news. The pieces are independent of each other. You can read anything anytime you open the book, but don't do it at night. It's not good for your sleeping habits. Now, there are 44 pieces, interviews, uh, articles, some published before and some uh, new that have not been published. There are five parts. One is the Third Republic. That has 13 chapters, talks about foreign policy and security, and uh, also on a fundamental clash that exists between visions of being Armenian or being Armenian. And that clash is whether the Republic is part of the larger nation and has responsibilities toward the larger nation. The nation is being defined not geographically, extraterritorial. That means the diaspora. So uh, the diaspora vision is different than the state, the vision of a state with concrete borders, concrete responsibilities. Whether the government is good or bad, we like it, we don't like it. It has responsibilities <coughs> to secure the borders, secure the people, and uh, go after the welfare of the people. So the, this conflict is as old as 300 years in our history. Uh, if you look at um, the political thought, I, I will not 
go into detail, you will see that there have been these two visions that have clashed over time. The second part is al Um and it has eight parts, uh, eight sections, beginning with an interesting document which had never been published. In 1988, when the Garapa movement had just started, as the rector of the Zorian Institute, leading a delegation of Harvard and MIT professors, Sister City, Cambridge Yerevan, we went there and the movement had started. And I, this was end of May, and I went to listen to what people were saying. I didn't know any one of them. And I uh, returned and did a report. And that report, which had not been published, is in this book. And I put it in there so that you can see uh, what I thought in 1988. How did that movement appear to me and where was it going? Uh, because some people uh, evolve, some don't. And when you evolve, you can see how and why you evolve. You evolve. Then uh, there's another piece that is quite unique uh, and was not published. I visited Baku in 2013 at the invitation the indirectly of the government. They wanted me to do a lecture. And I asked that instead of a lecture, we do uh, it, so that it's not Armenian versus Azeri. Uh, we invited a Georgian uh, scholar and invited an Azeri. He was a member of the parliament. So that was a three-sided uh, discussion. And I had exchanges. I made a presentation, the others did, and then exchanges with the public. And I can tell there were about 250 people, television, government people, ambassadors, etc. And uh, for me, those exchanges are very important because you see, we, we tend to look at ourselves and at our own logic and pain but we don't understand how others see us. And this is a good chance to do it. Then there's an article that has not been published and that is uh, done before um, the 2020 war, but never published because of it. So it is included here and it is about how to think and how not to think about the Garabal problem. Now, and then there's a chapter which was not published at all. I wrote it for this book, the role of the Garapa leadership in the uh, history of the Garapa conflict of the 30, 30 years, the last 30 years. We have never discussed it. We, we have always thought Garapa leaders to be pure, almost virgin, and Armenian leaders corrupt and bad. And that L dimension is very important. Then, the third part is the Turkey-Armenia issues and the genocide recognition politics. Um, uh, there are some interesting <coughs> parts there. I have an analysis of Erdogan's concept of the Armenian question and a debate with the former foreign minister and, um, and, and briefly prime minister uh, Daudo. He had written an article on the Armenian issue and I responded in the Turkish policy quarterly. Uh, then the fourth part is our march toward war, the 2020 war. That is, um, there were all kinds of signs. We were moving toward war, and uh, the Armenians, both in the diaspora and Armenia, and the governments, thought the danger was coming from Turkey and did not think there was a danger from Azerbaijan. The Turkish threat is always there in, in our political imagination. Now, uh, so there are three pieces on the, uh, there. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the fifth part is after the war. What happened to us? How did we explain it? What lessons did we learn, or did we learn any lessons after the war? That is, if we went to war, almost knowing we would be defeated. But then there's something wrong in our thinking that war that we will lose is a good thing. 
So it will be examined. It will be examined our um, political thought, our processes, whether a compromise solution was better than being defeated and losing almost everything, and in the end, all everything. So these are issues that are in the book. Now, <clears throat> a few words about how we relate to the world. Um, a fundamental uh, equation in our thinking is the comfort zone which victimhood provides. We are comfortable in that. We, are, we, we know how to deal with defeat and with victimhood. Um, now, mind you, victimhood is not a political category. It is not a political category. Uh, it does not provide for an explanation of events. In, in fact, it simplifies. It is almost anti-historical. Not that we are, have not been victims, but to feel victimized, we, uh, use that framework to analyze and to do policy for the future is very pro problematic. We can decide that Turks and Azeris are brutes, criminals, genocidal, and we are the victim. And then, yes, we are the victim. Where does that lead us? in terms of thinking of the future, so that we're not victims again. Uh, we focus on our own pain, our own plight. We believe in justice of our cause without looking at anything else from the outside. We assign roles to countries and organizations in the world, roles they have never accepted, they will never accept, but we still insist America should do this, France should have done that, Russia should have done that. If all of that had happened, then we would have been in good shape. But they decide their own interests. They, we don't decide. We do not assign them roles. But that's what we do in our political thinking. Um, I can go on on this, but I, will, I don't want to take too much time talking. Um, questions and answers will be, uh, will be better. Um, we, because we didn't try to understand the enemy, we acted as if uh, being right is what matters. You see what I mean? That is, we are right, we believe international law is with us, principles of humanity are with us, and therefore, in order for that magic to work, we assign the roles, but we do not understand why our enemies act as they do. We think understanding the other side is justifying them. But if we don't understand why the other guy is doing anything, then we don't know, we couldn't possibly know whether our reaction is right. If uh, Aliyev does or did what he did is because he hates Armenians, then you react differently. If you think he's got a strategic purpose, then that's what you respond to. So, but we are not ready. Um, you know, 30 years, and we don't have a site, I mean, for him within 20 years, let's say 20 some years, we still know him. No scholar, no government, no Armenian organization has done a psychological profile of Ilham Aliyev. The cost of that is tremendous. I've done some work, but I'm not a psychologist. I've done some work because I know him personally. I've met him, talked with him for three hours. And I, as soon as I got out, I took some notes about his body movement, about whatever. Uh, and initially, my impression was that what everyone said, he's a playboy, he's a humarbaz, you know, gambles, which may have been true. But when I, and my first meeting with him was, we came to for a lecture at Harvard, 
and we met briefly, and it was very negative. I thought he gave a lecture that was more like a tourist guide's lecture. But when I talked to him personally, he was extremely intelligent, very well informed. He knew what questions to ask and how to answer questions. So we're not dealing with someone who's crazy. We're dealing with someone who calculates. And if we don't know why and how, then we are in trouble. And we also thought of ourselves as somewhat uh, invisible. You know, when you're playing poker, which I've only observed, I've never played poker. I was more of a short guy. When you're playing poker, you get initial cards. You look at what you have, and it's good. It looks good. And the others are bad. But then, so you don't change your cards, because you think it's very high. But the other guys change their cards. Of the five, they change four. And you never know what they will end up with. But we always thought, it can't be. We don't even ask what they will do. We know we're strong. So, um, and then we insisted on Garapaz independence, which was an impossibility before the war, and it was a certainly not a possibility, not a possibility after 2020, but we still went after independence, and the, the leaders of Garapaz did so, the opposition to governments did so, at least in our administration. Pashinyan at first thought so, that it was possible. So we went after a vision which was based on illusion rather than reality. So <coughs> we also ignored um, the lessons of our own history. 300 years, <clears throat> the dominant Armenian political thought is someone will save us. Someone will save us. And for the most part now it's been Russia who will save us. And if it's not Russia, then obviously the US will save us. Macron's nice words will save us. Macron sleeps dreaming of us and loving us. That's what he said. The Russians were our big brothers and protectors. I don't need to tell you what actually they have said, or what actually they have done, not what they've said. Prime, uh, State Department uh, Secretary Blinken, a few days before the uh, September events where Karabakh people were gone, he said, Ethnic cleansing is unacceptable. Well, it happened. What did Blinken do? If it was unacceptable, not that we don't like it, not that it's a bad thing, but it is unacceptable. So if something happens that was unacceptable, you will have to have the appropriate response. And during the time our people were leaving Karabakh, he had a session presenting music diplomacy, and he was playing a guitar. It's not easy for me to say, but this is what happened. And it reminded me of seeing the Emperor Nero. You know, you've seen the movies. Rome burning and his fiddling. This is not easy to say for an otherwise you know, intelligent man who thinks he's, he, his warning would mean something. But <clears throat> let me tell you, the world has changed. It's no longer the world we knew even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. First of all, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, although uh, President George Bush, Papa Bush, talked about a new world order, Uh, one was never developed. For some time, the United States was the only superpower, really powerful military, 
soft diplomacy, uh, economic. For a while, the United States was. And uh, you may want to read Brzezinski's book, 1997, which said the United States has a window of 20, 30 years to create a new world order where our enemies would be minimized and our friends would increase, so the security of the US would. But that's not what we did. We went back to the Cold War. Now, uh, some people thought that with the end of the Cold War and of the Soviet Union, uh, we had the, uh, was it Fukuyama, Shai? Uh, the end of history? Francis, Francis Fukuyama. Fukuyama, yes. yeah. Fukuyama. Fukuyama had a book about, you know, ending the end of history since the ideological conflict had ended. Russia was going to develop as a... But he forgot one basic fact. The, the Cold War was not just ideology, it was geopolitical rivalry, which never ended, which went under the water for a while and then came back in different forms. And now we see Ukraine, we see uh, China. Uh, so that's one thing. We, did, we don't have a new world order. But also, the, there are basically two superpowers now, uh, the US and China. Uh, Russia militarily is, but not much else. But let's count it. Now, what is happening? Russia is trying to be a superpower and projects it by saying, I am ready to uh, sacrifice my youth, my soldiers, I'm ready to have them die in order to have my influence. And that's still in the works, we'll see. Russia, uh, China is rising, right? Uh, and the idea of that you can contain China is, for me, uh, not understandable at least. And the U.S., in my view, is a superpower, an empire under decline. This is difficult to accept, but think about it. I'm not going to develop here. Think, think of. Uh, read uh, the rise and fall of the uh, Roman Empire, and the symptoms of the decline of the Roman Empire are exactly what we see here. A dysfunctional legislative, an absolutely crazy agenda on, on uh, what we discuss, what we fight uh, between the, uh, uh, the political parties, the quality of people in government. This is, this is serious business. And presidents, if you look at, uh, you look at a President Bush son, Jr., President Obama, President Trump, how can the country can go from the one extreme to another? You have to understand that the, each one of them sensed that we were losing, but each one had a different reaction to it. Now, um, well, uh, and the second important point is that when we had two superpowers, the Cold War, the world was divided into three parts, politically speaking. The West, NATO, the East, Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, and those who stood aside and tried not to be involved. But they were careful not to go against either superpower. So, and those on the, the, the two uh, extremes of the spectrum, were very well disciplined. If Lebanon is on the U.S. side, Lebanon will not do anything to upset the U.S. and the West. If Syria is on the other side, they will not do anything. Now that's over. This is something people don't realize. It's 
It's not a, uh, it's an important concept that explains so much. That is, we have now regional <coughs> superpowers. Like Turkey. Turkey does whatever it wants. Turkey, a NATO member, buys weapons from Russia, says no to anything it wants. In the second uh, Iraq war, when the US wanted to use the Egyptian air base in Turkey uh, to, to move uh, weapons and soldiers to Iraq, uh, Turkey said no. That could not have happened before. Netanyahu came to Washington, was invited to address the Joint Congress, the Joint Chambers, and standing there, asked the legislators to reject Obama to oppose Obama, the President of the United States. I mean, I understand that Israel may have interests and would like the US to move a certain way, but that's not something you do going to the US Congress and saying go against your president. You talk to the president and you go against him. But he did it. And I'm not going to talk about what's happening now. So, um, <coughs> all of this suggests that we need a degree of maturity in strategic thinking. The world doesn't begin and end with us. Starting to 456 being, uh, being loved by other countries is really not uh, the key. I would rather be respected than loved. Uh, international diplomacy and geopolitical thinking is not a love affair. A lot of men beat up their lovers. Right? So even love doesn't solve the problem. We need to think. And we are now at a point where the 2020 war, the two attacks, 2021, 2022, by Azerbaijan against Armenia itself, indicate and the reaction of Russia and the rest of the world indicates that fundamentally we have no friends. We have no saviors. And our only hope is to start with that reality. To have peace, so we don't have any further military operations, which we cannot afford, and then start rebuilding. That's my advice. Before I, uh, we go into the question and answer period, I have to uh, make a confession uh, and apologize. A few days ago, I don't know if any of you saw the Quincy Institute uh, interview, that I did. Did anyone see that? Yeah. And I've been criticized fairly, justly, for uh, misstating a concept that I had when I said the Azerbaijanis did not target uh, civilians. And I did not elaborate, and that left a lot of questions and criticism, as I said, f fair criticism. But I want to first apologize because that, the way I formulated it, may cause pain to any Armenian, but especially those who suffered from the um, from the recent events when <coughs> civilians were harmed, killed, and harmed just before the evacuation started. It happened, and I apologize for that. But along with that, I should say the following. I do not think that during this last operation, even in the 2020 war, it was Azerbaijani policy to harm civilians. 
I don't think so. If we don't recognize that, then we're talking about part of the history. And we go back to what I said earlier, we are comfortable as victims. But feeling a victim doesn't show you a path to a policy. The fact is that at the beginning of that military operation in September, there were special forces that were involved from Azerbaijan. This is my understanding. And they did commit serious crimes uh, at the beginning. Then they were withdrawn. And I do not believe that there were any attacks on civilians. A hundred thousand Armenians left, right? Azerbaijan. It was Azerbaijan all the way to our border near Goris, right? They left. They were not harmed. That doesn't mean that the earlier issues or some incidents didn't happen. Me, I think politically, uh, I do not accept victimhood. I say there's a conflict, we lost, there were people who harmed, uh, and uh, it's something we have done in the past. is different than thinking morally. That um, our people in Garapal, from Garapal, are not hurting. And it doesn't mean that I should not apologize. Thank you. We have a special microphone. Uh, Maybe you can bring it forward. All right. I want to make a statement and I have a, a question, a lingering question in my mind. Uh, the statement I want to make is that I have to admit that I was one of those who thought that on the Russia's policies <clears throat> were too conciliatory, too concession, open to concession. Uh, we should realize at that time that Karabakh uh, had we been ourselves, for the very first time in history, we were victorious. We had the land, we had recovered, and there you have now Levon mm -hmm. der advocating what is his advocating, especially in this very famous paper that he came in 1997, when he said, by the rest, war or peace, it comes to get serious. My question was that. Why did Levon Dervedorsan lead the Arabah movement if reconciliation was he taught? Why did, I mean, this, this war complicated the issues? There is an issue which we rarely discuss, which is around the Azeris claim that there were 750,000 Azeris that were displaced. I don't know that figure, but it is a figure that you cannot dispute. You cannot say that all 750, it wasn't 750, it was 450,000. It's, I mean, critic is like, my question was that why did he lead? The second question was that, did he lead or Arapa movement was going to happen irrespective of him, you know, whatever he did, the, the Arapa movement would. The other question is that comes to like, what? Slowly, Vajra. Okay. Uh, Long question. <laughs> uh, I, I think maybe two is enough for now, so I yeah. uh, have a chance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, first, let me say that. Uh, I really love it. I said, "Yeah, there are lots of people that change their running names and 
Frage moderator. Uh, the first question on uh, requires a statement. Uh, the war in Garabal, the strategy for the war, was led by the Pedrosa. I was there every day. I started working in Armenia January 17, 1991. So I was a Soviet official for one year until the breakup. So, and I know how it evolved. It was there, I can give you examples if you need. The strategy uh, was level Der Bedrosian. So it's not that Karapau lost and not Der Bedrosian was giving it away. Number one. Number two, when the movement started, uh, the Soviet Union existed, and the movement's demand for unification was a domestic so Okay? This is key. When the countries became independent, then demanding unity is an international crime. Uh, that means we demand territory from another country. It becomes a territorial demand. No so you could not go if a member of the UN, OSCE, and to you have to accept the the change of the of the environment within which you're functioning. So I, I think that should do it. Secondly, as to why concessions, because we knew, we knew that independence was impossible, and we were proven right. There is not a single country in the world who from the 90s that about should be part of Armenia. Not a single one. I remember Rafi Ovanesian, the first foreign minister, was insisting that we recognize Garapal's independence. And then Bedrosian said, okay, you go and find me one country in the whole world who will recognize and I will recognize Garapal's independence. He couldn't. He went to South America, Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, came back with glowing reports that yes, they will, and none of them did. So it was impossible. We also knew that Azerbaijan had friends, and we really didn't. So the outcome was, that article said, we have to be realistic and pragmatic. We cannot go through uh, on the basis of our illusions and thinking that the world is going to recognize. We have scholars who found principles uh, of uh, international law, morality, humanitarian, etc., that said we deserve it. Of course we deserve it. But that is not to say that it will happen. That's the distinction between the two. So making concessions was to see what is the best we can do. So that's one. And uh, the second. Uh, the concession, the concept of concession, so being by corporal concession, should have come from the very beginning then, not as well, a conclusion, as a... Uh, yeah, uh, but the, uh, you know... Uh, why would he lead the, the war? Well, he was the, the war was imposed. We didn't start the war. Okay. Azerbaijan started the war. Uh, we have not undertaken any offensive operations. But we have done defensive. So we went and got Karabal, and you know, fortunately, and I think unfortunately, districts around Karabal. Uh, let me say one thing the Karabal conflict is and was very different from the conflict in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, uh, Chechnya, Kosovo, Kosovo. Kosovo. Uh, well, well, that applies too. That applies too. See, because these are Soviet conflicts, uh, I mean, post Soviet conflicts. The difference is that in none of the other cases, the separatist entity, Abkhazia, 
South Ossetia or Chechnya, had occupied any territory outside itself. The Garabakh case was the only one where not only did the separatist Garabakh uh, get under control of Armenians, but also as big a chunk of territory around it. And that is the, the, where the 700,000, 750,000 some say, but certainly not too far from 700,000, although they say 1 million, right? And I'll tell you a story about that 1 million and 20% of the land being occupied as a Azerbaijan. Uh, when I was having secret negotiations with my colleague Vafa Gulizade, uh, I asked him once, I said, you know, I have calculated all the districts that came under Armenian control, from Karabal and the seven districts around, as to how many people, according to the last Soviet census, existed and lived there, uh, Azeris, Armenians, whatever. And those we kicked out come close to at least 650, 650,000. And uh, some people say there had been growth since the last census, so maybe 75. Then I said, Rafa, why do you say 1 million? And he said, that's my number. He said, it's sexier to be 1 million. <laughs> you can't get up and say 750,000. And I said, how about the territory that we have occupied? I said, it's 16.8%. And he said, now, can you imagine us talking about 16.8? 20% is a round number. So I said, you know, I, I hate to uh, see you, uh, to have you be a liar. Maybe we should go, in fact, occupy another 2%. <laughs> so you're not lying, right? So anyway, uh, that, that's the issue that uh, first, uh, the environment changed, we became a state, independent state, responsible to the international community, and secondly, uh, that it was Azerbaijan that initiated, militarized the conflict. Nakharachin Hart Sir Kuzanais is on his say, Vercheres, Maki Security Council image. He they were very much on the poker each other, Borijamanak, Arpeking or Zeri Nahara, Hayastani, for I Tales or Arsakun Terean and Sarah's Pontoon. The Anis and Tamen Shamed Araj, Bachapeta, Idiotum, Hyderabad or Hyperlapse <laughs> Genocide <laughs> Is Chenki Devori, Miasalas Kerem, Lakta for the resolution? Resolution Chkar was up on Sasnel, him the Velo of Adrbejani and Mechperimana, Aselo for Nunis, Hayastani, Varchapet, the Haitaruma, or Hypenachan, the Voshmi Vatan Chisparno, Yedranis and Tamil and Mekor Heto, on Hook Charsaka Tatar besides. That is to Kavadak. Yes, 
Arzabesin Հիմա <gülüyor> Այդ կողմը կերտար ուրիշ ֆորումի մեջ կպանակցեր եւ իրենք անդամալուծվեցան ավոր համար նույն բաժանով իմ գարդիկովս ամուտան ցյան խորուտը անդամալուծված է լսեցին այս արեցին հիմա իրենք կրնան հայտարարությունը նեն որ բայրամովի ասածի վրա արեցին բայց այդ բոլորը ինձ համար կոն է իմ աշխունին որովհետեւ տեսեք ամուտան ցյան խորուտը ինձ եւ իր Ajin <gülüyor> for different reasons, for changing reasons. So uh, that's my comment. So it is, I, I agree, I'm not saying it, but I'm not saying it, but I'm not saying it. Uh, yes, Chengdenar, but I'm not saying it. Yes, Chengdenar, but I'm not saying it. But I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it, I'm not Duk mist kongnaki cekere var mı? Beş yıl var mı? Çünkü ne alıyor ne spetka? Çıştra gün, çıştra gün kader ama hiç meri gözüne insanmış. Yer spasalı ki da gayrim hedo tohumuş pes uzmanını. Bazen de bunu ki çakasım ekleze dağımı. Orada sıkala sıkala dinuma meri gömüz, kader dinuma meri gömüz. Yer spasum en korunuşları çıştra lanet meri ne kalmam? Et anlatmaya. Yedir parça var bu Şahitlerki Mena es martı, şarına ki mena vurpes var çapet. Mek miyayın, hoş miyayın ki korsunen kartsakı, ki korsunen ki nayev hayastanı. Desek, yes aracın nereneyi, bur kısa kısa bir badirazının edo, kravur, kreci un var çapet ve diğer acarakandı. Habis olur. Yes çem üzerim ha, acakan ne rokta korsel. Varcabedeki 
Ամբեսորիմ Ոչ <gülüyor> A different, a different angle on, on matters. My understanding is that Israel armed uh, Azerbaijan against Artsakh. And uh, we also know that the loss of Artsakh did not serve the security interests of Iran. I'm sorry, what of Artsakh? The, the loss. We lost Artsakh. Ah. That loss was clearly not in the best interests of uh, Iran. And uh, after that, uh, we also know that Iran helps Hamas against Israel. The fact that uh, soon after the Artsakh war, we saw the Hamas-Israeli conflict erupt. Do we just say that's a coincidence, or could there be perhaps a retaliation, a proxy war of some sort going on between, uh, you know, between Iran and Israel? And if this insight were true, how might that inform our diplomatic efforts? Well, uh, Artsakh was important for Iran, but I'm not sure that it was so important as to make it an international issue. Iran, uh, in the Organization of Islamic States, has always voted for resolutions that condemn Armenia. So Iran has its policies, has its interests. Uh, as long as the conflict was there, there were some benefits to Iran. Uh, but uh, if the conflict is over now, 
The picture is changed. There is So, um, as to the coincidence, well, that would have to be viewed from Iran's point of view. Um, it seems to me, I don't know, I'm not uh, privy to the decisions of Hamas as to when they decided to do and how, what to do, uh, but it seems to me that a larger reason uh, that may involve Iran here, I think, on a, lot, on a larger, uh, bigger, uh, higher level. That is, uh, we know that a lot of the Arab countries were coming to terms with Israel and were signing, were to sign, including Saudi Arabia, uh, which would have ended the Palestinian issue for any politically practical way. Right? If Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar and uh, you know, Morocco and whatever they start accepting Israel existence, uh, regardless of what happens to Palestinians, that would have been a very serious problem for Palestinians. So, uh, acting now, there may be other reasons, but in my mind, it is related to the Palestinian uh, effort not to allow their issue to be and they had to do something. Uh, now, I don't have special insights, but this is how I put things together. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what to say. Go ahead. Dr. Lieber, Lieber. Uh, my name is Armand. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, I have a different question as well, uh, similar to the train of questions we've had. Um, we talk about peace. We talk about the notion of peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and it's a complicated question because there's the notion of treaties, there's the notion of what gets written down, what do the two countries agree upon. And on our side, that usually means concessions. That's what we think immediately. We think there's some aspect of concessions that are needed here. Now, as a diaspora Armenian here, I have been exposed to organizations, grassroots organizations, that try to bring Armenian and Azeri civilians, as well as diasporans on both sides, together for dialogues under the notion of peace. Uh, to bring common ground, to find similarity between the voices that both sides carry, and to, to find some better human understanding of each other. Now, that, those organizations that I've seen have faced a lot of criticism from both sides, saying, what's the point? Why would we want to engage with these two And both sides, meaning Armenian and Azari. Yes, yes, I should, thank you. Uh, on, so, Armenian and Azari perspective say, what's the point? And my question to you is for the younger generation and the generations that are going to be born after this conflict, born after 2023, and they're going to see this, what are your advice and thoughts on what that peace process looks like for civilians and diasporans? Well, um, let me ask you a question. Sure. What practical difference does it make for diasporans? that there's peace or no peace. I think just confidence in your in your overall nation and, and, and your, your pride, I would say. Well, that's not a practical issue. Fair. Uh, does the diaspora lose his home, her home, her car, her job? Now, there's a human element. Mm -hmm. Because of our ethnic uh, um, origins, uh, that human element, the There is a... The earthquake, but certainly after independence, Armenia came to play a much bigger role uh, in the identity issue of Armenians. That is, if you go to Armenia, spend two weeks, three weeks, and come back, and you see the flag at the United Nations, etc., the need to define oneself is I've been in this country since almost 60 years. And every generation comes up and say, who is an Armenian? Am I an Armenian? Is language important? Is this important? And that question, does not have answers. 
But once Armenia became independent, it became an anchor. You take school kids, sixth grade, ninth grade, to Armenia for the summer, they come back and they ask those questions far less frequently and fundamentally. So, uh, and Garapa was something even more than Armenia. Because as I said, it, it was idealized. Um, Arme Ar Armenia, you could criticize all you want, but Garapa is this uh, holy prize, you know, this place where you go for pilgrimage. Uh, and we assign Garapa all the positive traits and Armenia uh, often the negative traits of governance. Well, the loss of Garapa uh, creates in the diaspora a lot of a sense of loss, deep loss, a sense of uh, threatened identity, shame, right? Because we lost the war and we couldn't resist. These are very important things. But they're not practical. That is, uh, we are not threatened by Azerbaijan. U.S. We can't, on the other hand, on one hand, Azerbaijan is a threat, and a threat to Armenia, and at the same time not see. I, I can't see how we can do both things at the same time. Show of hands. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Spirka 
این کار را می نیزانم کن. وای ویاده نو رسبیل کن می بگو کار گازما گیدیتون بگو کار گنستهر خوسر هرسون که هرسنر گازیک که هرسنر یه بگستور ویر ایس کانی انکم نرده ایرازم شینانر ویر چه کنسترکشن ایگ ازم ایز آروست بارون نخکاین هد گوزف نگار کشفید یه گنستیک خوزید در بدروسیان گنستیک بسور ویر هرسون گارسن اینچ پس کشانی اینچه بشین ما رماستیونه فیناس نرو مارتی کوکاین یه وای اید سپرک ورش کرگایدیون گسکار ترامپوزین آب چیست ترامپوزین باز نه خورت کوزین یه سیگار زن ور سپرک سپرکی گاز مانده بودیم نرک کیچ ما آویلی این کینس در ازی ماسی بهت که مدادن لوا خواهد اور این چی کرد زد این چی چی کرد زد گتان گویی که آبارگا پس آنیگا نایف سپرکی وکی نه اور گزه پام مدار Հայաստանի մեջ տես այմորացինան։ ժողոքոր տանտան դեկար ալլա։ Եվ ինչպես աստ բյուրկը չի պահան չեց հաշվետվություն դված միլիորներում։ Ներանյալ երեկ դարի առաջի հածը։ Աս է ասած ասած հաշվետվություն պետ է պահան չէ։ Եվ գու� Եվ բուրարդեն սիստեմ էր այդ տղյակներ այնադեն կարուցվեցին, Քոչարյանի և Սերջի Սերսարկսյանի ժամանակ։ Ես չեմ կիտեղ որ ուսակցությունը, որի եգեղեցին կննատատեց։ Այս է։ Ե� Մեկարահարջումունեմ։ Եվ եվ որ պաշինյանը հասկծուց, որ ինքը այլևս բադերազմ գիտիտ չն է, բադերազմի հալյարակ է, հարգավ ժողովուրդը ուզեր, որ իր զավակները չի զողնին։ Անիկան մեկ, եկրոր, Um, we're, after all that has happened, there's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking, wringing hands. If we had taken this deal, things would have been better. That deal seemed so much better. My question is this. Once Azerbaijan had clear military superiority, would have they not simply ripped any prior agreement and simply done what they did in terms of just military walking over everything? And isn't the bottom line military? Since, as you said, there are no friends. Self-sufficient um, garrison state. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, here's the answer. 
Um, we need to realize a fundamental uh, thing about parties dealing with each other in a conflict. Your logic, I mean, I mean the questions are good, but it assumes a certain logic. Yeah. I said it was a simple question. Yeah. No, no, it's a simple and a good question, but it raises an interesting issue. That assumes uh, that what we do and say doesn't matter. Okay? That is, let's say, the, let's take the September 1997 uh, uh, OSC proposal, which became the, the focal point of that uh, got Deborah uh, sent to resign. Let's say we had done that deal. Your logic assumes that no matter what, this is where Azerbaijan would have ended. But that's not the case. That is, if we at the time had done it, the hatred would not have been so much. Okay? The hatred between the peoples. The humiliation that Azerbaijan felt, and we see it today in Aliyev's speeches, the humiliation they felt would not have been there. And Haydar Aliyev would have left another kind of Azerbaijan to his son Ilan. Okay? Now, I can never be sure 100%, right? Uh, but this is the weakness in some of our thinking, that it had been determined by some higher authority that Azerbaijan at the end will kick out the Armenians. I don't think there is something. I know that uh, having been part of various kinds of negotiations, mm. that if we had made a deal at the time, Azerbaijan would have developed differently in his political thinking. Ilham Aliyev would have been thinking differently. Even in 2003, Ilham Aliyev invited me to Baku and I had that long talk with him. And his questions and his comments uh, were such that he may have, he wanted to come to some kind of an agreement. And then as time went on, and for 20 years, we didn't do anything, we didn't agree to anything, uh, that was workable, and of course it involves concession. It involves concession because we are not, we don't have the military, uh, and certainly, you know, I, I've written in 2005, 2010, 2015, every year we wait, we will get less in negotiations. I've been saying this for 20, 25 years. They're getting stronger, we're getting, we're not moving up. And when they're getting strong, stronger and we're not making a deal, every day we will get less and that's what we ended up. So this is my answer. That but you're saying we're not making a deal. It, that seems speculative because while they're make, getting stronger, we should be getting stronger. That's another thing. You know, so I, I that, recognize that. <coughs> Look, you know, I, I don't know uh, how strong we could have gotten. Let me say this. In the argument leading to forcing their Bedrosian to resign, uh, there was one very important proof is Kocharyan Serge and Vaskin presented. When the Bedrosian was saying, Look, they're going to get stronger and we should do a deal now. They argued that if that refers to oil, and at that time it was more oil than gas, uh, that uh, Azerbaijan is going to get more money, and Armenia does not have that kind of money. And they argued that if he, the Bedrosian, makes genocide recognition the foundation of Armenia's foreign policy, and this and this, then the Diaspora is going to bring 400 to 600 million dollars a year in investment. I have this in writing. They presented this in writing. Okay? Next. And, and they did it, and what happened? Why didn't, uh, when they removed him, and they uh, had a policy as they wanted, and for 20 years, 
No one saw 400 million a year. So that is also part of the diaspora logic. So that should be. Uh, we are live streaming this event now. Talin is doing it on our Facebook page. And we have a question from a <coughs> viewer on Facebook. Dr. Libaridian, in past lectures you have dismissed pan-Turkism as a functionally irrelevant phenomenon, adding that it's used mainly as a scarecrow or a boogeyman by Armenian ultra-nationalists. Given recent developments, explicit Turkic racism, expansionism, ethnic cleansing, would you care to re revisit these assumptions? You know, uh, pan-Turkism exists, but to what extent it is the driving force or the foundation of policies is a different question. So, uh, there is, uh, you know, we we took Karabakh and established the Lachin Corridor, and that is pan-Armenianism, right? A kind of. Uh, I do not deny that the element, the dimension of uh, pan-Turkism has been present since maybe the early 20th century. And certainly the Young Turks used it. They used pan-Islam. They used pan-Turkism. Any ideology to get this side or that side with me. But is it fundamental? That's the question. When we started the first war, Azerbaijan, because of, its, of the people's, most people's ethnic origin, Turkey, got Turkey to help them. Then, because of its Islam and Shia Islam, they expected Iran to do the same. So, this, these are ways to create alliances. Um, so, uh, I, I do not uh, see that this is uh, the way to analyze the situation. If you think that even Azerbaijan, but certainly the Central Asian nations, want to be dominated by Turkey, or Turkism, you know, then you have to study all their policies and their directions, right? The components of their policies to see whether that is the dominant thought. There is an organization of Turkic peoples, yes, but it's, uh, you know we, we don't uh, we don't see that Kazakhstan is acting accordingly. In the early uh, independence years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Turks thought that they could go and dominate and teach the Central Asians. Central Asians said, uh, forget it. Even now, there's some concern in Turkey that Azerbaijan is determining. So they're, they're acting as nation states and having their own resources. Oh, well. if, you, if you want to give your name. I Oh, uh, my it's name up. is uh, My question is, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, we don't have real friends. Uh, people don't like us just, just because we're Armenian or no, Russian. They like us, but that's the yeah, I mean, they won't be there for us. <laughs> but does, does that, is that, is it realistic to say that we shouldn't seek strategic alliances because of that? Uh, my question comes from the fact that I believe, strongly believe that one of the major factors, one of the major reasons that we lost the 2020 war was our confused uh, orientation. We had a prime minister that was called Western, uh, West that didn't really find it in their interest to be there for us. Uh, the Russian president was kind of uh, turned off by that. Uh, why would I help a people who's elected leader is, uh, is bashing me all the time. I mean, uh, that confused orientation, I think, uh, global politics that was being played, played against us uh, okay. during the war. Let me try to give short answers so we have as many. Uh, seek strategic allies? Absolutely, yes. Are there any who are willing to dance with us? I don't see them. Uh, I see France selling us weapons, India's... The, the fundamental question is, if Armenia is attacked, and it was attacked, 
Is anyone ready to send the truth? They can't even sanction Azerbaijan. Okay? There's no country that said, let's sanction Azerbaijan. That's number one. So we seek, but we should know the limits of that strategic alliance, what it can and what it cannot give. So that's number one. Number two, the, I do not think that the Russian attitude uh, toward Armenia uh, is caused uh, mainly by Pashinyan. I don't think so. Russian diplomacy over the years has changed. Russian diplomacy, particularly after, before and after the Ukraine war, it has changed and it, it has become very, very crude and rough. I work with Russian diplomats and have contacts with them, some of them till now. They were the most refined, most sophisticated, the best prepared diplomats I've seen. And it was easy to work with. They had great respect for Armenia, even if sometimes they thought they were slightly the older brother, you know. But it was possible. That's not the same Russia anymore. It has become extremely demanding and demanding subservience. So that's my explanation as to that there are larger reasons why, uh, why things went as they did. And also Azerbaijan has become very important and Russian interests in Azerbaijan are greater than in Armenia. So pressing, pressing uh, Armenia and uh, demeaning Armenia has become part of the Russian game uh, and I won't go further. Mr. Balci. Thank you, Dr. Baradian, for an enlightening uh, discussion that you have generated. My name is Kirkor Balsi. I wanted to ask a, a question uh, that we didn't uh, address uh, in this discussion. So, Sorry, Krikor, can I intervene? Sure. I would like to say something about Krikor. Every Wednesday we gather together. He's one of the boys, and he's from Turkey. He shuffles between here and uh, Istanbul and other places, so for you to know his background. <laughs> Thank you. Basically, I wanted to uh, ask uh, the role of uh, trade in this whole country. I'm sorry, the what? The trade. Trade business, yeah. buy and sell. And if uh, during all my travels all around the world, uh, especially in the Middle East, if you take uh, Jordan, Egypt, Israel, the only thing that holds them is business, straight. Because as a broker, United States, struck a deal that these three countries won't uh, hurt each other and U.S. will give them special uh, dispensation. Yes, no. uh, a question. Uh, trade between these three countries you're talking? No, I gave you as an example. I'm now going back to Armenia. No military strength, no financial strength. No, uh, I would say, uh, cultural strength or tourism strength relative to uh, other countries. And wouldn't it make sense for Armenia to do what they have done all around the world the best, which is trade? And why uh, do you think Armenia wouldn't uh, didn't all take this route to be the trade route between all its surrounding countries, which Turkey is dying to do that, jumping over Armenia. And uh, I don't uh, understand uh, why trade is not a part of the solution instead of uh, additional land, additional uh, 
complex. Um, what is your opinion about this? Well, uh, the reason is political. That is, both uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey uh, have made it clear that uh, for trade you need to open borders. And uh, the borders open if the issue is resolved. So, uh, I know, for example, right? Baku Jehan Bakbali. The most reasonable route was through Armenia. And uh, we wanted that background. But, uh, you know, they said, uh, you settle Garapa and you get the pipeline. In fact, Heydar Aliyev preferred the route of Armenia and to deal with Armenians rather than Georgians. Because he thought, and this may be prejudicial toward the Georgians, but he thought once the issue with Armenia is resolved, Armenians are more reliable than Georgians. Other than the fact that uh, the Georgian route cost three hundred million dollars more. Yes, correct and true, and I, I agree with you. And I know uh, that uh, there is a perception that uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan are their brothers, one country. That's not. If you look at from deep inside, this is not true. Yeah. Armenia, I mean, Azerbaijan and Turkey uh, had very difficult times with each other. But it is, again, the money that brings them together. But not let me remind nationality, you, uh, not all these things. Let me remind you, Krikor, that there are political parties, both in the diaspora and uh, Armenia, that oppose trade with Turkey. They're vehemently saying Armenia will be taken over financially. Or that you don't trade with uh, the... We have already been taken over by financially by Russia for many, many years. But, you know, I'm, I'm not saying they were right. I'm saying that the reasons are mainly political, both regional and internal political. Well, you know, uh, I think so too, but... Uh, Պարոնդի <gülüyor> Եվ սպյուրքի մտածարակերպի տարբերությունները ձեր ինչ են ցույց տալիս ձեր ուսումնասիրությունները շնորհակալություն բավական բարդ հարցը բայց բարձ պատասխանը ունի շատ ուրախ նախ որպես հիմնավորում նախ սպյուրքը մեկ քաղաքական ցույց չունի սպյուրքը ցինք արդեն շատ բարդ երևույթ է որ ով ինչ գուսե Եվ սպիրկի մեջ է փոխվ աները։ Այսինքն գա գազմակերպած սպիրկը ուսակցությունները եկերացիները եվ այլը եվ կա մնացած որ հսկա մեծ մասը ոչ ուսակցական են ոչ համակիր ոչ ալ անթամ գոյվ է բանի, բայց անում գազմակերպած չեն։ Ամես որ ես ինչ որ գտեսնեմ ուսակցությունները եւ երեցիներու Tirkoroshumu spürki gap çuni Hayastani hamar part katsutyan archev lutum neri gap çuni I think ne zaman garivore spürki hamar Türkere vaden Azerbaycanlılar vaden voye ve pangor Türkiye etkanet vaden վստահելի չեն եւ միայն պետք է քրիստոնյա պետությունները որ վստահի։ Սա կապ չունի սա իդեոլոգիայի, սա կապ չունի ստրատեգիկ մտածելակերպի։ Իսկ Հայաստանի ոյև է իշխանություն, ոյև է իշխանություն, ստիպված է մտածել ճիշտ կամ սխալ, պետք է մտածել այս ժողովրդի անվտանգության դարած իր դարածքի անվտանգության մասին։ Եվ բանեմ պամը Ուրեմն անգամ Հայդարալիևից խոսեի 
բակվում 99-ը թե չեմ սխալի առաջին անկարգացի եւ քրկիս համար գուզել հարցազրույց վարել եւ այդ խոսակցում բացվեց եւ ասաց ինչ կնամնել այս հարցը ուզելու համար բարաբարի հարցը եւ ի լուծում չեմ գիտեր այսինքն լուծումները գիտենք բայց նախ եւ առաջ մի խոսիս հայաստանի նախական ռոբերտ կոչարյանի հետ եւ հարաբանի նախական արկադի ուրասյանի հետ դու կսեք որ ցեր քաղաքացիներն են բայց ամեն օր կհայվեք ա երկուս միասին չեն լինի սա լավ ռոբերտ հասկացա բայց արկադին ինչու ուսի դա հարաբանի նախական է միշտ հայաստանի ուսա բայց ռոբերտը հարաբացի է ուսի այո բայց ո՞վ է հարաբացի որ գու կա հայաստանի նախական գլայի վարչապետ ստիպված է մտածել քիչը դարբեր ծեղով կան հարաբան եւ այդ դարբերություն այդ մեդագանության հասկացողությունն է որ դու բադասխանատես շատ հստակ կանի իսկ սկիրտի մեջ մենք բադասխանատու ենք մեր ծեղասպանությամբ սահմանված մտածելակ է ձեր հեղինակավոր կարծիքը ինչ միսի նա պարոն Լիբարիցը ինչի մասի ես ես նույն մասի հայաստանի բաղվա հայաստանի բաղվա այո դա ու շարձ մեն ձեր հեղինակավոր կարծիքը հեղինակավոր կարծիքը սանը որ ես մարկարեջ եմ հաջարգանություն այս այն առաջ չեն առավել ոտան քնիշատնա որ ադրբեջանը նրանակավին մեկ կամ երկու գործողություն ունել մեզանից է կախված նաև եւ հիմա մեկ քայլ արքայլ է գերտանը պետք է խաղաղության համաձայնություն լինի հիմնական սկզբունքներ որու մեջ կմտնեն նոն յուս օֆ ֆորս օր թրեթ օֆ յուս օֆ ֆորս դա այդ երկու սկզբունքները որ մեն են եւ մենք սկսենք աշխատել հիմա միշտ դարելությունը կա որ ուժը կողմը գնահ խանկարի բայց դա ճանել է եւ շանսը ճարնելը եւ այս 30 դարվա մեր պատմությունն է որ չեն տստայի չեն տստայի իրենք ամեն չեն տստայի իրենք իրենք ամեն չեն տստայի ուրեմն եթե չմստային եւ բամը չնենք կլխուս նոր փորձանք կա փորձենք վստահել եւ տեսնել ոչ ամեն նույնիսկ եթե դասը դոգոս շանս կա որ մենք գնանք խուսափի լավակայի պատերազմները ավելի բարձ դրամապատություն չեմ տեսնել ես Thank you Մարդի Փարոսյան I want to thank you for your service to the army and uh I I wasn't trying to ask you when you were here before I know we have a set up Uh, the Ukraine and Russian uh, conflict if it's resolved to the benefit of Russia would that lessen the impact on Armenia or if it didn't would it be uh, harmful to Armenia I have a question we're in trouble <laughs> either way we're in trouble either way because we don't know what kind of Russia we evolve We don't know what Russian thinking will be. We just don't know. At least I don't, and I haven't seen any uh, strategic thinker or scholar who has, who can predict reasonably well as to what kind of Russia will emerge. Because if they lose, then they may decide that they will do stronger action to regroup the former Soviet republics. If they win, then they may say, well. we can do it or uh, there could be a change of policy or government that says look we need to get russia reconstructed you know whatever so i i don't know another question follow up uh, is armenia important to russia you know that they have azerbaijan and turkey kind of is it important to it russia? is it has importance yes it has importance 
But importance doesn't mean that they'll protect you. Then they didn't. Uh, Russia and Armenia have a fundamental treaty which we signed in 1997, mutual defense, right? Mutual defense is if, the, if Armenia is attacked, Russia will help us. If Russia is attacked, we will help Russia. That's what it is. And what happened in 2021 when Armenia was attacked? Russia and up the, uh, uh, the defense uh, treaty uh, between Armenia, uh, Russia, uh, I think Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. What happened? They didn't help, and they argued that we're not sure of the border. Yes. Well, you know, um, I don't mean to demean our Russian and Kazakh and Kyrgyz colleagues, but when you signed the treaty and you made Armenia part of it, what did you have in mind that you would defend if Armenia is attacked? If we didn't know the border, uh, then you should have asked Armenia to clarify the border. But they didn't. They said Armenia. When Russia says mutual defense. Now, in my understanding, even in 1997 when we were working on that major treaty, at least to me it was clear that, um, uh, first of all, we weren't thinking that much about the Azerbaijani threat. Uh, but it was mainly with regard to Turkey because of the historical Russian-Turkey uh, issues. It was, uh, and I suspect that if Turkey attacks, Russia may do something. Uh, but they did have Azerbaijan in mind. Their interests are different. But at this point, you know, Turkey and Russia cooperate on these things. In Syria, they fight each other. This is the world we are in. Uh, the, there's fragmentation of foreign policy. Uh, on some issues, Iran and Azerbaijan cannot come together. On other issues, they're doing the railroad north-south, <coughs> the transit route, and they're doing all kinds of things together. Azerbaijan, Iran, uh, Azerbaijan, Russia. Azerbaijan is very bothered the fact that the Russians are there. And one of the problems <coughs> is that over a period of time, and certainly after the 2020 war, the function of Karabakh, Arsakh, and its people, internationally seen, was the excuse for Russia to be militarily in Azerbaijan. They didn't see anything else. As a, for Azerbaijan, they had the choice of keeping them or kicking them out. And yet, uh, we behaved a certain way, and increasingly they saw Garapal as the excuse by which, according to the November 9, 2020 uh, ceasefire statement, Russia was able to get in as peacekeepers, right? And Azerbaijan didn't want that, but they accepted it for, for the time being. Well, I, I don't know. There, well, there's no excuse to be. And the issue of return of Gar Arzakh Armenians there is in the interest of everyone except the people of Garabao or Armenia. Why is there talk of return when 30 years Garabao leaders told their people, if uh, we are under Azerbaijan uh, and without Russia, we don't stay here. We, they said that for 30 years. Okay. And so for Azerbaijan, eventually Garapal Armenians became the excuse by which Russia is staying there. And this was unacceptable. On the other hand, they have all kinds of trade agreements. Russia says Azerbaijan is our strategic alliance. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that what we see as Garapal and what others see as Garapal, why is the United States talking about return of Armenians? Why is Europe talking about it? when it's an impossibility. They're talking because when our, there was ethnic cleansing in Garabal, they did nothing. Despite their promises and their threats, they did nothing. Now they're talking as if it's not over. 
No, we can still have a Garapa issue. That's all. They're covering their, you know what? Sounds talking good. about the return of Armenians. I thank you for the very interesting discussion. Um, two questions. Uh, first, what do you think of the very new foreign policy of Armenia, where um, they state that they want uh, diversified security cooperation with practically any country that's willing to cooperate. So we know Armenia already buys weapons from India, and Armenia is going to buy weapons from France. And just a few days ago, uh, Germany, Germany's foreign minister said they're uh, also open to cooperation, and Armenia is also uh, negotiating with China and might be other countries. So these are all different countries, different orientations. Uh, what do you think of such a policy uh, with the view of Russia that's uh, against this, although they are also weaker? And uh, my second question is, what do you think of... Hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I'm an old man. I, you know, I have to go one by one, step by step. Uh, what I think about uh, uh, the diversification of foreign policy, I think it's a good idea. Uh, what comes out with Russia, I, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people think of India, but India is not there and will not get involved in a military conflict. Uh, my preference is diversification, but uh, fundamental question, who do we see as the threat? Right? Europe, Germany, France. Che, che, uh, who, who is the threat? To, who is oh, threatening right. Armenia? Uh, we know Azerbaijan. Uh, well, right now, uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Russia. This in, in Turkey, in 30 years, has one Turkish soldier entered Armenia? One acre of Armenia yes. being taken? No, directly. It, that's indirect. I'm saying, did they take any? Did they uh, <laughs> violate the border in any way? You know, we have to be very specific when we say Turkey or China is a threat. We have. If you leave it general, you cannot have a response. Russia. Now, I'm sorry. Russia. Well, uh, you know, Russia is a threat to Armenia's self sovereignty. Yes. You know, do we talk about it? Well. My preference is, as I said earlier, you have the uh, strategic alliances, but know what they can actually give. But to the extent that we perceive Azerbaijan and Turkey, your best security concept is to settle your issues with them, minimize the threat. But only if, if you have some significance, they'll talk well, to you. Well, they're talking to us. They're talking to us. But they also have different plans, like all of Armenia's, I'm sure you've heard, Azerbaijan teaches, uh, uh, Azerbaijan names for practically all of Armenia. So and, that's and, like official. And we teach Medellin Western Medellin Azerbaijan, etc. And we teach Mesodikran, Greater Armenia. As a history. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my second question. What's your view about the so-called Zangezur Corridor? Many people think that that's no longer a threat to us because they back down, at least for now, but maybe that's not the case. Well, it's difficult to say. It's difficult to say at this point. Uh, first of all, I would never use the term corridor for Zangezur connection. It's a transit route question. I think it can be done. It can be done uh, in a facilitated manner for Azerbaijani citizens to visit directly without going through Iran, with Nakhchevan, I think it's possible. Uh, Azerbaijan has said that they have no intention of taking it by force, many times. Now, you may believe or not, uh, you may believe 10%, 90%, but this is where we are. And they're saying they, they now go with the Iran route, right? The Jeep route. And they've, you know, they've been working on that for a couple of years. Whether they have lost interest, as they say, I'm not sure. But um, they, uh, it is <coughs> possible that they will do it the Iran route, but also go 
the railroad exists already, right? The railroad line from um, Julfa to uh, to eastern Azerbaijan. So uh, these are high. As I know, as far as I know, Armenia is not against it, but it has to be uh, sure that uh, Armenia keeps sovereignty, number one, and reciprocity. The second problem with that is that while Azerbaijani interests as defined by them can be uh, solved with the Iran detour, Russian interest is not resolved by Iran detour. Uh, Russia is much more interested in the in that transit route than even Azerbaijan. The November 9 says that um, communications would be open uh, and that there will be a facilitated transport, uh, unimpeded transport, uh, which is still under Armenian sovereignty, but security provided by Russian Now that statement, which was equated to a uh, an agreement, a, it's a statement, but it is, um, the three sides were obligated to accept it. And, and there, in that, uh, paragraph 9 did uh, provide for Russian border troops securing, providing security to uh, Azerbaijanis and others. But that agreement no longer is valid. Of the three parties to that conflict, two at least violated it. Azerbaijan violated by attacking militarily. Russia violated by not leaving Lachin open, doing nothing. And uh, Russia violated when there was expulsion of the armies, do, doing nothing. So Russia, with a military operation, Russia lost its legal footing for that. So. Uh, that is a problem even between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, we'll have to consider if they go through it. Uh, on top of that, railroads. So it's a very complicated issue. Okay, two more questions. One from my dear friend, Popadina with Dr. Barina Tarpian. And I have the last question, if you guys don't mind. We have, we have a lot of questions. Uh, Girard has a list of other many, many questions that probably at one point you will answer it somehow. I don't know, it depends on... You're not today. <laughs> but I, but uh, this, is, uh, this is from uh, uh, a listener. It says, kindly examine how the ceasefire from the 1990s contributed to the current catastrophe. In answering the question, kindly compare the terms of the 1990 and 2020 ceasefires. How did, uh, but the ceasefire was 1994, so yeah. we know that. So, yeah. In May, started in May, ended in July. That ceasefire was the initial ceasefire, the text was done great effort by the Russian uh, diplomat Vladimir Kazimirov, extremely accomplished man. He, uh, we were ready for the ceasefire. We didn't want to continue the war. It was Baku that was the problem. So we, we worked on that. So that's 1994. It is a very limited the 1994 document, and it has the two of the documents. One was uh, Ambassador Kazimirov's document, May 1994. The other was uh, July document, which was negotiated 
between Mr. Gorizade and I. The first document said, uh, such and such day hostilities end, number one. Number two, uh, the, um, there will be intensive negotiations in the next 30 days uh, in order to have a political document that would include other elements. Now, the first document was seen by both Armenia and Azerbaijan as temporary. That is, the question was, we stop hostilities, then we have 30 days of intense negotiations, which we hope will end up with a political agreement. Therefore, the ceasefire is now a political treaty. What if, at the end of the 30 days, we do not have an agreement political, for a political treaty? Is the ceasefire still obligatory or not? This was the question. And that question, Kazimirov did not want to address. That's why we took the initiative, negotiated with Baku, and we had another document that said, such and such, we started 30 days of intense negotiations, uh, and we considered this a ceasefire that will last until we have the political document. And that's all there is. The, the uh, November 9th, 2020 document has communications issues, has, has a number of this. It has nine paragraphs, while the 1994 was extremely limited, less than one page. Dr. Chinansum, Dr. Livaridian, who some of the steps of the Jamboard there, he showed us in the demo chat and that's why it's very jealous. Come on, Saka for Sansu Yaman, that's in Gamsir, YouTube, and Hatsazu is the name of the the sick world Washington in said Yarzika Uzetsin, Yede Haravain of Gasman, Ne American Tevoch. You have two Gazika the week, said Yarzika Chehavi Vile, Ad Kernak elaborate an Eliavieta Vochesik in Chuboche by Sokincha, Gasutuna, Amelgai, Haravain of Gasi, Mutka. As a chief was actually seven back some in it, it was like some. Am başından fırsat sunuyor. Hayat sped kadar var mı? Yunan adam ki afolut. Yev, İran Samarkani ve Biden administrasyonu nereye gats? Yev Dagavi insetten beri. Yani var mı? Adam ki afoluti artsır başından nere? Ankara istak çek ima. Selo pasadırlo amaç sayı. Noyember ina. Yer guaza kısam pasta tuhde. It regionalized the conflict. It moved it from an international arena to the region. I think Francan American Tursmanazi, which make course in the United is de facto announced the war of Turkey. I think the Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Turkey, Ayastan. The year no emperor in the past of the day, Turkey and Chica, by pastoring Turkey, America, and France, and the war. Ulemen, iman kısan kısan pasta tuhdo, yansarın ağabeyi tuş tırmayacak. Minski kumpu vorarken mahatsu komayı meçer, lütfetsak pastoren çıkar. Yev ulemen harca anel vor iman yansarın ağabeyi Evropan ağabeyi harca anel. Biri porsel müyün sevov karnı bil aynı garapari konflikte okta korzel vor ilenk Ներկայությունն � Հայցինենք 
Dr. Rivaridian, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting exchange of ideas, your ideas and the questions and the answers, and we hope to see you again.